If I asked you which brewery in the UK uses the most citra, you'd probably say Brewdog, maybe Thornbridge, but no, the brewery that buys the most citra in the entirety of the UK is a real ale brewery in Peterborough. So Bradley. Yes. If I put a gun to your head. Go on. Again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is your favourite hop? Oh, it's like asking what your favourite child is, Johnny. Is it? I don't have any children. I've got two cats. <laughs> but it, I mean, it is Citra, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> Citra, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a hop that, that comes with a, a, a mythology to it, you know? It says it on the tin. It's called Citra. It says, yeah. It's, it tastes like citrusy, doesn't it? You know it? what to expect, Fruity. yeah. And, and you know, there, there's there's a brewery that loves Citra so much, and yeah. indeed understands the mythology and that that great name so much that they named their beer Citra. Clever, clever. They, they got in there early with that. <laughs> I, like did. I like they it. They did, thing. and it's become one of the most important beers I think made in the UK. And that it's it's Oakham Citra, and yeah, it's man. a beer that means a lot to us because we used to drink it a lot. At the Old Fountain, uh, the pub where the Craft Beer Channel was conceived. Yeah. Um, mentally conceived. Just to be clear. Physic uh, <laughs> physically conceived <laughs> over um, a pool table. Yeah, so it's a really important beer and it's taken us a long time to actually come and tell this incredible story. How has it taken us this long, Johnny? It's cask ale meets hop forward beer. It is, it's, it's basically our two favorite things, but also two things that typically don't necessarily go together. There's a lot mm. of people out there that will tell you that you can't have really hop forward cask ale, you know, the, the lower carbonation, the higher temperature, the, the richer malts that are often used in it, they can clash. But actually, all of the people that brought this hop over started with really hoppy beer. You've got Fine Ales, you've got Oakham, you've got St. Austell, Jaipur as well uh, from, from Thornbridge. So this is a really interesting story about the technicalities of brewing, but it's also about the incredible cultural impact that one beer, one hop, and one incredibly technical approach to brewing uh, can have. So yeah, this finally is the story of Oakham Brewery and the story of Citra. The story of Oakham isn't just the story of a brewery. It's the story of how Citra first came to the UK and how the first British Citra beer ever brewed is still perhaps the best and truest expression of that hop. Who better to tell that story than the man responsible for it all, Oakham's former head brewer, John Bryan. So we're stood over a steam vent, or at least Brad is, and we're here with John, who you've been here almost since the, since the start of Oakham. Almost, yeah. I, was, um, I actually started in 95. Um, it had actually been going two years at that point. The first brew was on the 13th of September. I remember that quite well because it's my dad's birthday, or it was right. at least. So it was pretty small. It had a maximum brewing capacity of uh, 20 barrels a week. So we fairly quickly expanded that by buying another 500 foot unit, putting another fermenter in, which meant that we increased its capacity by a third and we could do yeah. 30 barrels a week. <laughs> so um, that was... Uh, that was pretty amazing at the time, but uh, it didn't take us long for us to get up to capacity. And, you know, within, um, within a like 18 month mark, we were already starting to look for a, a larger facility. So that's, uh, that's when we started looking around and we ended up moving over to Peterborough in the, in the brewery tap, which is still a facility that's associated with us. And we've got a small pilot plant in there now. We were there for, uh, I don't know, what was it? 98 we got in there and we were there until 2006 is when we finally got this place up and running right so just before what you're wearing on your t-shirt sort of happened and things really yeah just yeah up. just 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 before that really and we, the interesting part is when i first got there it wasn't the style of beer that i most favored you know i actually like things that were a bit more traditional such as uh something like a Fuller's ESB, something like that, but something that was a good balance of molten hops. Uh, as we took it over, we had three styles of beer. Um, one was JHB, which is 3.8, light and hoppy. We had um, Hunky Dory, which we soon ditched after we'd been running a few months. And um, we had Old Toss Pot, which was 5.2. Wow, and that is a brand name from the 90s. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a character from a play. You know, he's the drunk, he tosses the pot. 
Right, okay. Yeah, so that was it. And he just had this rosy cheek sort of drunkard on the pump clip. So, and, and instantly that was my favorite, you know, but as time went on and I started to, you know, gain confidence, I started to do progressively more hoppy beers. And the hops were really what I got interested in really quickly. And as I said, when, when, when we got rid of this beer, um, it was Hunky Dory, there was one other recipe in the book, it wasn't mine, it was John's. He'd done it for the, uh, the Peterborough Beer Festival back in 95. Um, so j literally just before we sort of took the place over and it was done for um, Bishop Westwood who was then leaving and, and you know leaving the cathedral so it was called Bishop's Farewell. I had tried this beer at the festival I said why don't we bring this one back and replace Hunky Dory and that was predominantly Cascade that's that's the main hop that was in it and Cascade is really linked to the sort of citra thing more than most people know because it was back in 2001, so we'd actually we'd moved over to the middle site, so the one in Peterborough, it was the old um, labour exchange, and we're brewing there. We'd literally just won uh, Champion Beer of Britain in 2001 with JHB, but, and when it was a favourite of ours back then, the Bishop's Farewell was really beginning to suffer. I just couldn't get the flavour out of the hops that I was uh, used to getting. Now, as I said, it was a long, long time ago, and I, I don't want to sound derogatory on the people I get the hops from, because, I mean, it was all a big learning curve for all of us. But some varieties, they, you know, because you only get one crop to last you all year. And some hops keep better than others, and some degrade quite quickly. Now, Cascade, unfortunately, is one of those hops. And even if you get the best sample in the world, if you keep it badly, it gets to sort of August, September of the following year, and it's like it just drops off the edge of a cliff. And that was basically what was happened, but it happened this year far worse than I'd noticed it any other year. And in fact, it was so bad that we stopped brewing Bishop's Farewell because we were getting complaints about it and we just couldn't get those flavours out. Thank God the internet hadn't taken off by that point. You didn't yeah. have yeah. an army of real crucified. <laughs> Well, pretty much. So I had a word with our, our hop merchant and um, I said, look, would you be up for a trip over there? Because I'm really not happy with the way things have gone. There was a number of farmers that he was dealing with directly. And he said, well, I'd like to go out and actually meet them and, and, and check the farms out and stuff. And obviously, my history is in farming as well. I was doing that before I became a, um, a brewer. I was fifth generation. Had to let dad down on that one. But um, well, when so you're going to make beer, I'm sure he wasn't too much disappointed. I think he forgave me in the end, yeah, okay, bless yeah. him. But <laughs> it took a while. So. Um, yeah, the, um, the first trip was then put together as a one-off trip. We were going to go out, we were only there five days, we were going to stay at one farm in particular, and uh, we were going to visit a number of other farms and try and make our selections out of, out of what we saw. Like I say, it was a chaotic trip, five days. I mean, at the end of it, I thought I'd been in like a washing machine or something, and I didn't know what was day and night or which end I was facing, you know? It was, it was just crazy, the amount we packed in. Um, but the result was that the hops that came back were by far the best that we'd seen and a lot of um, you know, other customers had seen as well. So much so the comments and everything that we're getting back that uh, Paul... So the, the drinkers immediately were like, whoa, what's happened to Well, not, not just the drink, it was the brewers, the people that were actually right. using the stuff to produce the beer were just saying these hops are incredible this year, you know. So it warranted going back again. Now, on the build up to the... Um, the 2009 visit, we were, we were given the option to um, take a look at this new hop. Now, as far as I recall, and I think I'm kind of about right on this, originally, I think it was Sierra Nevada that had picked up on this varietal and had it grown up to incorporate into their beer called Torpedo. And they'd done it on a very small level, um, but this year there happened to be, there was a few kilos left over. And he said, well, we've got this, you know, variety on the side for you to try. Um, let us know if you're interested. Well, yeah, I mean, I got my hands in it, you know, and it was like, oh my God, and instantly, you know, through goosebumps, all the hairs are standing up on me, you know, and it was like, my God, this stuff smells awesome, you know. And even today, I mean, there's, there's other ones that have come out, like Mosaic and bits and pieces like that, and, you know, it's still, it's still my favorite hot by quite some way. And back then, I was just absolutely adamant. It seemed like it was destined to be that, I had got my fingers in it first, so I wanted to make sure that I was the first guy to brew, brew with it in the UK. So instead of putting it back on the boat and chugging it over, which can take months, 
Um, I said, look, there's not a huge amount. Let's stick it on a pallet and we'll fly it over to myself. And I actually got it. Um, I got it in November of 2009. It was November the 21st was the day I brewed, first brewed with it. And so, how, how many sort of uh, brews would that get you through in that year? Well, it, the, this is another interesting point, you know, because yeah. um, I had to make a decision about what the hell I was going to do with it. Now, as I said, the kind of beers that I like are around about five and a half, six and a half percent. And although it wasn't in my head as Green Devil at the time, Green Devil is the beer I kind of wanted to produce. That was the sort of beer I wanted to produce. But obviously doing that meant I could only do it a few times. And for the first time, and it was probably the last time as well, I made a commercial decision, which was um, I'm actually going to do a beer that's commercially viable. And I don't like session beers. <laughs> so I kind of edged it as close to a session beer, but not as I could get and sort of went with 4-2. And the thing was that allowed me to get one brew out in uh, 2009. And then I could do like every other month, we'd have a couple of citrus in it, you know. And it did take a while. It was, where were we? I think it was 2015, I think. So about five to six years later, um, it actually overtook JH Beer as our bestseller, which had been our bestseller for 23 years. And what, what I really love about, about Citra, and, what, and about all of your beers, is the amount of hop character that is in a cask beer. Because if you speak to an American brewer, or you speak to a lot of British brewers, they'll be like, you know, cask isn't the best format for these very, very hop forward beers. But there's a couple of brewers in the UK, like you, like Fine Ales way back, just behind you guys, like St. Austin Pop Job, that just proved that that's not necessarily well, the case. You, you know where the brewer from Fine came from, don't you? From here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is, is there a trick to that? Is there something you, a way you've worked out of being able to bring, you know, big bitterness and big hop aroma to, you know, a less sparkling, um, warmer served beer, I guess? Um, a little. Um, I mean, one of the things we don't do is trying to get, get a, a handful of hot cones and threaten the copper with it and go, look, this is what you could have had. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, do chuck, we do chuck quite a bit of hops at it. Um, I've, I've seen. You're I've, teasing out different sort of notes of the hops, presumably from the start to the finish. That's it, yeah. I mean, that's, that's again, uh, when we like to say different times that we put them in. So, um, and I, I honestly do believe that, that that's what gives it its kind of, you know, it, its fullness. Um, I guess also another important thing that I think is increasingly people are realizing this is also that hop selection process as well. So you're still going out regularly, well, every harvest and picking well, I, the hops. What are you looking for in your citra? There, there, there are two main sort of groups that I sort of tend to gravitate towards. There's one that sort of goes particularly grungy and it's kind of got that real resinous kind of, you know, stickiness to it. And that tends to be with the higher alphas in the hops. And you can rub them and you're like, oh, bloody hell, yeah, you know. But going another way, they're, they're sort of not as grungy and they're more, um, they're more tropical. And I will, I will tend to go to the tropical ones over the grungy ones, but the grungy ones are great for that background and the bitterness and all that sort of, you know. Because I've never found a hop that has everything to the level that Citra does. There's always hops that are great for aroma or bitterness. And sometimes they make a pretty good fist to doing a single hop variety. But I've never had one that makes it a, such a complete flavour profile of, as using 100% citra. Yeah. That moment that you first smelled citra and you saw that concession that was left, did you know at that point that that was like a pivotal point in British beer history, nope. your sort of life as a brewer? There wasn't a moment where you just went, oh my god, I've never smelled anything like this. Well, as I said, I mean, it, it was pretty special at the time. The thing was, by the time it actually got back here, it had ripened still further. And I was, I was actually acting quite silly for a change. Um, I was cutting off strips of the burlap and like wrapping it round me and oh, like this. <laughs> and when I, you know, obviously when, I, when the beer came through, was I surprised? Well, no, pleasantly surprised, yes. You know, uh, and I was, yeah, really, really happy with the end product, especially as it was, you know, straight off and I thought, well, you know, there's no need to alter that because I thought I might have you know, normally always do a bit of tweaking, but I just didn't bother. It was just it was just fine as it was. But I say, you know, I, I didn't have any inclination that it'd be the success it was. I knew I had something.
that something completely changed the fortunes of Oakham and helped it become the regional powerhouse it is today. Managing a runaway success of a beer is tough. Any brewer will tell you the difficulties of scaling up a beer quickly, especially ones with a legion of die-hard fans. But I've never heard of anyone complaining Oakham Citra isn't the beer it once was, a common criticism of beers this old or well known. In fact, in the time I've drunk it, I think it's got better. That's a testament to John's hop selection, but also the constant process tweaks going on behind the scenes, all in a bid to extract the best from the hop. While filming a Citra Brew Day, we witnessed seven editions of hops, all at different times and in different vessels. There was the Kettle Edition, the Hotback Edition, the Whirlpool Edition, and some kind of giant tea urn thing with a boat motor in. And then, of course, there's the hefty dry hop. So we sat down with current head brewer Ed at the tap room right by Peterborough Station to talk about the beer and the remarkable way it's made. My, I mean, my first experience with Citra, I was working uh, at a pub in, in Birmingham, Birmingham at the time, and uh, I remember just sort of taking some out of the tap, and it was just, yeah, a completely different experience to what I had, hmm. you know, growing up drinking broadside and other sort of perhaps more traditional English beers. So it was, yeah. You know, on the on the cask side, it was the hoppy beer. Yeah. You know, it, it's basically a session IPA yeah. if, in sort of modern modern parlance. And what really amazed me watching that that brew with you and Ollie was how not just how much hop was going in, but how many different ways that it was yeah. being added in the manual processes. So it's going in three times during the boil. During the boil, yeah. Um, and then you make a hop tea, and you have like a. Uh, I, I don't know what what was what was that other thing with the. So yeah, normally that you know. I mean, my understanding is normally a hop back is just used as a filter, just to filter the yeah. work, you know, leave the hops on the, on the top side. So we're just adding the fresh hops in there. Um, what we've done with, certainly with the hop tea in the last sort of couple of months is really look at how we can be adding it, the temperature that we're steeping and infusing the hops. Um, and I think that's the thing when I sort of talk to other brewers or do brewery tours, you know, they, people always ask, how do you get your beer so hoppy? And I think, you know, you've just got to start with A, a really good product, even before you start the brew. Um, and then just being clever how you add them and making sure you're, you know, you're getting the most out of them. They cost a lot of money, so mm. need to it was, sure we're... When, when we went to The Alchemist in Vermont, uh, John Kimmich had, there, had, had a wonderful line where he said, you, sh you should sweat a little bit making beer. Because <laughs> yeah. if you don't, it means that you haven't sort of got in and amongst the ingredients. You yeah. haven't smelled the hops, you haven't you know, tasted the grain. Yeah. You, and, and that seems very true at Oakham as well. In yeah. that, you know, by the time you guys have finished each day, you're absolutely coated in hops. Yeah. There's the manual labor of, of, you know, Ollie was <clears throat> plunging at those hops of putting them all in by hand, like rubbing them beforehand. Yeah. It's incredibly manual given how big your kit yeah, is. Yeah, I, um, I think when we do, yeah, when we show people around the brewery, I think that they do think that we're a certain size that there's, you know, it's, most of it's automated. Now there is a certain amount of automation, you know, if you're brewing with two tons of, of barley, you know, you're not, not you know, doing that by you're, hand. You're not going to dig that out very quickly by hand. So there is there is that. But yeah, you know, we, that's the, the the important thing is that we are still in contact with ingredients, assessing them every day, and just sort of seeing where we can improve and and do we need to add a bit more of this or can we swap this out? And you know, it's just making sure that we are as hands on as possible because that's you know that's where all the that's where all the flavour comes from. I, obviously, we'll, we'll we'll get back to Citra uh, as a hop, but before we do, I'd love to chat about the rest of this beer because mm -hmm. you know there are hundreds of all Citra beers out there in the UK now, but yours tastes very, very different. And before we get to, you know, the hop side of that, what, what are the, the, the malts that are going into this? Okay, so um, as I was saying, when we were in the mill room earlier, Barris Otter is our sort of pale malt of choice. Um, yes, it's you know, at the higher end of the market um, in terms of price per kilo, but it really does have, you know, a really clean, really clean flavor, as well as all the other the other aspects do it in terms of how it clarifies and, and, the, and, the, and the proteins and everything else. It, it just really does provide a really nice, clean flavour because that's what, you know, most of our beers are pale and hoppy. Yeah. And we want a nice sort of steady malt base to really sort of pile the, um, pile the hops on top. So um, the Griscals are relatively simple. You know, a lot of America, particularly within sort of New England movement, people won't touch Marisotta because it's got too much, you know, kind of honeyed and biscuity yeah. kind of character, which I think with this beer really works and it complements the hops because the hops are bringing a kind of sticky yeah. stickiness and with the marisosa that amplifies it and makes it feel like yeah. a much bigger beer than it yeah. really is. And, and then the, so you've got your own yeast 
strain yeah. is is that a yeast that has a lot of character to it or are I think, you looking um, for cleanliness? yeah it, it def yeah I, so it's the same strain that we've used for well for 30 years well since, well, since Oakham was founded so um, John will tell you that it is the same strain although there were a few weekends apparently in the early days when he left the bucket out over a weekend and it may have mutated slightly I mean you know <laughs> back in the day John's hygiene wasn't you know in the early days wasn't wasn't overly great yeah um, quite a lot of professionalization of yeah. Oakham and indeed breweries yeah. in general in Britain yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah it's the same strain we use for all of our beers um, and I think o over the, that 30 years it must have taken on its own sort of character. I think, you know, I find when, if you're tasting our beers, whether they're light beers, dark beers, strong beers, there is that underlying sort of oakum character, mm. I think, so. Can, can you put um, a finger on it flavor-wise, or is it just something in? I think, I think it, do, it does have, it does have, it does have a, it does have a bitterness, um, yeah. but it does have, you know, it might sound a bit sort of silly, but it does, it does have a, a citrusy quality, and I think it, um, I guess would work really well with the American hops that John yeah. was, and be, like you say, maybe instilled with more, yeah. more kind of tr tropical or citrus notes as, yeah. as, as he went along. So those hops, so we've got all of these different um, ways that they're being added, times that are being added, temperatures that are being added. And I think, you know, a lot of people talk about single hop beers being a bit simplistic, but it seems like you do everything to a hop that you possibly really can yeah. <laughs> in the brew um, to get everything that citrus kind of has. Because it is, you know, I mean, we haven't even talked about the flavors of this beer for people that have never had it, but it, you know, it's like there's honey and biscuit, but there's, there's sticky orange and a little bit of pine and definite kind of, you know, overripe mango. Like, I wonder, you know, the recipe hasn't necessarily changed, but the hops must have a little bit and it I'm sh smells I'm sh like a modern I'm beer. sure they have. Um, I mean, I think for us, using, it, using Citra as a single hop beer, and, and, but also actually really using it, as you saw in the brewhouse today, predominantly leaf hop as well, I think certainly has a... Mm -hmm. Provides a certain, you know, its own character. I think um, for me, because we use leaf hop in the brew in the brew house, and then we add some T90 pellets on for the dry hop later on on the cold side. I think you really get that nice balance between the notes that you know, the nice sort of florally, more aromatic notes you get. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm sure that comes from the leaf hop, and then the sort of the more resinous notes you get from the, the pellets later on. Yeah, it's it's. It's an interesting sort of, I guess, again, it comes from, you know, the, the craze for, for IPAs, but we, we, we consider, a lot of people consider pellets superior to flour, mm. but they're just different, right? You, you get yeah. a different character from them. If you don't want the flour character, then you should be using pellets. Yeah. But there is yeah. definitely something that disappears when you go all yeah. pellet. Um, yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've tried a few different um, dry hopping methods in the brewery, in, not just with Citra, with, with other beers. And... Um, We've got our little sort of wheel along. We call it the Dalek, a little wheel along sort of hop rocket type thing. Um, and when you load up, a, load that up with purely with leaf hops or purely with pellets, the difference in in hop profile you get is is really quite astounding. Mm. Um, so I think there's yeah, there's definitely a lot to be said for for still using leaf hops. So, you know, I think a lot of breweries that I sort of visit, they've sort of moved to you know, whirlpools and purely just sort of T90 or you know sort of pellet based. Um, but yeah, I think I, I don't think Citra. Our citra would be what it would be if we'd if we'd moved entirely to the pellet. Mate, after nearly ten years, it's incredible. I, the feeling to still be surprised by a brewery visit and yeah. to see a process in a sort of how they craft something and tease something out of a hop yeah. that I've never seen before. Yeah, I was absolutely amazed when, not when I walked into the brewery, the brewery looks a lot like other breweries. And you know, we, yeah, we struggle to be surprised now by, by particularly hop forward breweries, but there, there are processes going on I'd never heard of. There were bits of equipment being used in ways I'd never expected. Um, it's like a boat like, propeller. Yeah, in there boat at one propeller. Point. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing as they try to squeeze. <clears throat> you know, I think sometimes breweries are quite lazy about citrus. You know, yeah. you throw it in in big enough quantities during the high, dry hop, and you'll end up with something delicious. I've not come across a brewery that's gone, yes, yeah, citrus is amazing, but what can we do to make it even more amazing? And, mm. and it turns out you make a hop tea, you put it in a boat motor, uh, <laughs> you add it three times throughout the boil. Yeah. You do your hop selections very carefully, which you know other breweries do do. But it was really interesting to hear that for um, for Carscale as well, from from an American hop style. Just 
an incredible process goes into making this stand apart from others? It's, uh, this glass of beer is a love letter to the Citra Hop. Mm. In no other way any other beer I've ever tried before. And we're now in this rare position with a video and with a beer where somebody goes like, why is that beer so good? Yeah. I've literally got answers for Oakham Citra now, which I don't have for many other beers that I love because you go there and it feels like everything else is the same. Yeah. Here I see, feel, smell and taste the reason that Oakham Citra has been such a big part of our lives and of so many other drinkers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the 30th anniversary of Oakham Brewery. Uh, here is to 30 more years of us drinking Oakham Citra. <coughs> Beautiful. See you in the retirement home. See you there. There'll be a bar there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah.